Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is the Sequest Lifecycle CubeADM deep dive session. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, CubeADM, what have we done with the project recently, uh, and also where are we going uh, in the future. <laughs> okay, so first of all, who are we? Uh, I'm Lubomir Ivanov. I work for VMware. Uh, the Open Source Program Office, and I've been contributing to Kubernetes since uh, 2017. Hey, I'm Fabrizio Pandini. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm a SQL Lifecycle contributor since two years, and uh, I work for Unicredit in Italy. So before we begin, I wanted to ask the question, like, how many of you uh, have used KubeADM to create a cluster? Wow. <laughs> pretty solid presence of KubeADM users. Uh, OK, so we can adapt the talk based on that, I guess. Uh, so before we begin, for those that do not raise their hand, we have to explain what KubeADM is. Uh, so KubeADM is a tool to provide you with a best practice, fast, and secure cluster. Uh, and also, we focus mainly on the user experience and you know, making it easy for the users to create these clusters. But we have to mention that KubeADM is not a cluster that, uh, is, is not a tool that manages the nodes for you as a cluster. You, you can run KubeADM only on a single node. And that's part of the Unix philosophy we are following here. Uh, so you have to provide the machines, you run KubeADM, on these machines to connect them in a cluster, and then you install the CNI plugin, which is something that we also don't manage. Uh, so some, some other takeaways from the design we are following is the design, uh, basically the, the user experience should be simple, the cluster reasonably secure, uh, the scope is intentionally limited, and we basically only deal with the local file system, the Kubernetes API, and we are agnostic how you can run the kubelet, almost. Uh, setting, uh, setting up, uh, basically, or favoring a certain CNI plugin is out of scope. Like, all of them have some benefits. Uh, all of them have problems, so we are not favoring the CNI. It's up to you to decide. So we are going to outline quickly some recent changes in KubeADM. KubeADM is GA. Uh, for those that do not know, GA means uh, general availability, or basically we are stable. Uh, the stability means that we have stable command line UX. So if you, you are already using KubeADM uh, in, your, you know, in your clusters, in your infrastructure, we guarantee to you that we are not going to break the command line. Uh, and we ha when we deprecate something, we have to keep it around for 12 months. That's the GA deprecation policy of Kubernetes. And we are following it. Uh, so something else is that we have a stable underlying implementation. We have no plans to move away from static pods uh, for the control plane components. We have component config for the kubedm config configuration itself. And also, we are using it for uh, the kubelet and kubeproxy. And also, we have bootstrap tokens for the join and init workflow. And we don't have any plans to move away from that as well. Uh, also, part of the stability we provide is we provide upgrade paths between Kubernetes minor versions. And if you ever wonder, it, uh, like, do you support uh, jumping between a couple of minor versions? Well, that's, that's a topic for Kubernetes as a whole. And we are following the best practice of supporting only from minor to the next minor. That's about upgrades. We have a configuration file. Uh, it's uh, the, currently the version is v1 beta 1. This cycle, actually, we're going to upgrade it to v1 beta 2. The changes are minimal. Uh, but basically, our uh, backend like API slash configuration file is stable. It, it is broken into multiple, uh, basically, uh, sub-configurations, and it's uh, ready to be used in, like a Swiss Army knife, pretty much. Also, we have uh, Kubernetes phases, and the Kubernetes phases are basically a mechanic where 
some of our main commands, like Kubernetes, in init, and join, we have them broken up into subphases uh, where you can, uh, for instance, run, uh, skip the pre-flight of the Kubernetes init command, or only run the, you know, the phase, the phase that is kubeconfig uh, uh, for the Kubernetes init uh, workflow, or for join, uh, you know, uh, you can completely. Uh, skip some of the phases for the control plane or only run the kubelet start phase. It's basically, uh, we are making it as customizable as possible. And in the red here uh, is, we're continuing to develop the phases, by the way. So in 114, we extended in it to support a certain uh, feature that Fabrizio is going to talk about, that's porting certificates. And also in 114, we didn't have joint phases at all. So we, uh, before 114, so we added like the whole phase runner, uh, basically logic in 114. Uh, next steps is probably uh, 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 basically phases for uh, reset or upgrade. We are still kind of, this is still kind of in the works. Also we did a survey for those who participated. Uh, we would like to thank you. Uh, basically the overall, one of the main questions was what is the you know, general UX in QBDM and we got a, uh, average score of four out of five, which is pretty good. And also, we ask the, the the big question, like what is the most desired feature that we you want us to work on? And people responded, HA. They want high availability clusters. And the past couple of cycles, we've been focusing on that, pretty much. So this part, uh, Fabrizio is going to take over. It's about HA. Okay, great. So let's have a first check about the survey. So how many of you are using uh, uh, Kubernetes high availability features or already? Okay, a few of you. How many of you are planning to use it? That's great. So today uh, we are, uh, I'm going to talk about two different aspects of the uh, high availability. The first one is certificate copy and the second one is the dynamic workflow that you can achieve with Kubernetes for high availability. So let's get this started. What is a certificate copy in a nutshell? When you create a high availability cluster, it is important to keep in mind that you have to, to share some certificate, your certificate authority and the, uh, account signing key among all the control plane in order to get your, your cluster work. And uh, there are many ways to do this, but the, the approach that best uh, fits with the Kubernetes workflow is to create the certificate on the first node within it, and then keep the certificate and move to the second control plane or to the third control plane before joining it to the, to the cluster. This, uh, this operation before uh, V114 was basically manually and uh, in charge of the uh, cluster operator. But what we found out is that this operation was error prone. And this is why in 114, we, uh, Kubernetes provided a new feature that is called the Kubernetes automatic copy certificate. Now the question is why should you care about this feature, even if Kubernetes is doing all, all the EV lifting for you? There are, there are few reasons, but I think that the most important one is that you have to take care of how your, certi your primary, your private key, uh, private key um, interface is, is managed, how your cluster certificate is managed, because if someone gets access to those certificate, basically they can destroy your cluster. So how does it it's work? It is pretty simple. When you do in it, you have to pass one flag, which is minus minus experimental upload certs, and then before Kubernetes creates the certificate as usual, and store them in the ATCD Kubernetes PKI folder. Then Kubernetes detects that you have asked to upload a search. So what it does, it reads the search, it encrypts all the certificate, and it stores the certificate in one secret. 
okay? Then finally, kubeadmin gives you the instruction for joining a new control plane, control plane node using those certificate. So what is important to, to notice here is that kubeadmin at any time is not actually copying certificates around. It's just keeping this certificate storing them uh, in, in a place that, is as, that will be accessible, accessible for the joining node and applying, and applying a little bit of security on top. The, uh, the actual copy of certificate happens at join time when you join using the, the command uh, flag that uh, kubeadmin provided you. Basically what, what happened is that Immediately after, after pre-flight, Kubernetes downloads the certificates, decrypts the certificates, and store in, in, the, in the ATCD Kubernetes uh, PKA folder. And then the, the joint workflow goes on as usual. Hmm? Uh, so, uh, first uh, uh, set of uh, takeaways. When we think about uh, uh, certificate copy, you have to remember that at any time, uh, certificates shared across the control plane are encrypted and are uploaded in, uh, in, the, in a secret, which is called the Kubernetes search. At join time, certificates are downloaded and decrypted using the certificate key. This is how it works. Another thing that is important to notice is that uh, really, really important, the certificate key must be kept safe because if someone gets access to, to this key and to the secret, they get access to the secrets that control your cluster and it, it can be destroyed. Another thing that is important to, not, to notice is that uh, uh, for, uh, for sec additional security reason, uh, the Kubernetes search secret gets deleted after two hours. So if you need to join another control plane afterwards, basically you have to go to an existing control plane node and run upload a search again. And this is the final. Okay, I leave also the other two notes uh, uh, for you to read in the slide that are already available online. And I move to the second topic of, of today, that is uh, dynamic workflow. What is dynamic workflow? Uh, uh, dynamic workflow is a term that we use to refer uh, a behavior that is in Kubernetes since its creation, a behavior that you get because uh, due to the uh, workflow in its joint workflow. And, uh, and basically, we are referring to the fact that with Kubernetes, you can change your cluster dynamically. So you can create your cluster, you do in it, and then you can decide to join a first set of worker node. After some time, you can add a, a new node, and so on and so on. So you, the, the topology of the cluster can, can change dynamically. Why we should care about Kubernetes dynamic workflow? now that we are talking about uh, uh, high availability? The answer is that b because basically the workflow for creating a high availability cluster in Kubernetes use exactly the same pattern that, was, uh, that is already known and was already used for uh, joining worker nodes. But there are some additional consideration that should be keep in mind, so let's start digging into the, those considerations. First consideration is that you need an external load balancer in between your nodes and your control plane. Once you have the external load balancer in the middle, basically what you can do, you can init your cluster and then you can grow your control, the number of your control plane nodes by using kubeadmin join and passing the, uh, the flag with the only difference that you have to pass the flag minus minus experimental control plane. And it is, it is the, exact com the exact same workflow that you use to worker node. 
to grow the number of the worker nodes. What is important to notice is that there is no predefined order. So once you need to cluster, you can join control plane node or worker node at any time and in any order. You can start with a single control plane node, join worker, after some time add a, 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 turn your cluster in a real HA cluster, adding control plane node and move on, move on, move on. So this is a dynamic workflow. This is what we define in, in the, with the term dynamic workflow. Another consideration that you have to keep in mind when you think to this workflow is related to a, a TCD. As, as you know, uh, with Kubernetes, there, is, there are two modes to work for a TCD. The first one is that you provide an TCD cluster, external, built somewhere, and you connect your control plane to this TCD. If you are not doing so, Kubernetes takes care of creating a it has an ATCD node on the machine where you're doing it. How does this change uh, with the, the new feature for your availability? Basically, if you are in this condition, you are using a local ATCD, when you grow your control plane, Kubernetes dynamically grows also the ATCD cluster. That means that growing the number of control plane, you are, you are also uh, moving from one ATCD member to two ATCD member, and, and so on. And this is also the reason uh, why, uh, when you are in this configuration, typically you end up with three or five uh, control plane nodes, because you have, taken, you have to take care of the quorum problem of, of the, t the TCD cluster as well. So, Wrap up for this part. In order to set up an HA cluster, you need before an external, to set up before an external uh, load balancer. Then you can init the cluster. And after, you can join uh, the control plane. And after you can join the control, the, the control plane nodes, worker nodes, in any order and uh, at uh, any time. Some consideration for, for, this, uh, for this workflow. In case you are not providing an external TCD, a stack of the TCD cluster is automatically generated and is spun across all your control plane nodes. Another consideration is that we could mean and, uh, and the dynamic workflow basically certificates are specific by nodes. And, and uh, this, is, uh, this can be easily explained if you think that when you create the certificate for the first node, you does not know in advance the node that, that will follow. So you cannot add the certificate sans, all, all the IP address and whatever. So, but mean when, when create a, a new node, basically create certificates with all the required information for that node. For the same reason, the API server instance on one node is connected only to the, to the, TCD, so to the a TCD node, which is local to that machine, because Again, we don't know in advance all the TCD members that will be created in the, in, in the future. And uh, last point, which is really important because we received uh, many issues about this, is that uh, if you want to preserve the dynamic workflow, please don't override the address fields for Kube API server or, or uh, ATCD, like uh, advertise, advertise address, or uh, list and client URS. Because uh, if you override this flag, Kubernetes basically preserve what you're passing and, and uh, the node uh, and the cluster stops growing dynamically. Great. So l last uh, couple of slides uh, is just uh, a, a, a summary of all the work that, that we did to implement the CHE. And just to give you a picture of all the effort that, that uh, 
is behind this, uh, this work. So the first slide gives you, uh, uh, basically represented the starting point that is Kubel mean creating a single node cluster. Creating a single node cluster in Kubel mean was a process that basically means to create some artifacts like the certificate files, like uh, Kubel config files or static pod manifest. Mm? Those, those artifacts are stored on the disk of the local machine. And also to create some artifacts in the cluster as soon as the Kube API server is started, like created the Kubermin config map, the add-ons like Core DNS or Kube proxy, or airbag rules. Those, those artifacts are deployed in the cluster. This was the situation at the, at the beginning. Creating an HA cluster, this is the, the grand theory of uh, uh, HA in Kubernetes. What that means, means first of all, you have to copy from the first control plane to the second control plane all the certificate and service account that must be shared across the, the control plane. Then you have to, to generate only the certificates that are specific for this node, for the new node, for, for the joining node. After that, you have to generate all the kubeconfig files that are necessary, with, with the exception of kubelet.conf. Why? Because we want to use the TLS bootstrap, so there is an additional layer of security on, on the joining node. And this allows, for instance, cl a cluster administrator to prevent node for joining without uh, permission. After that, you have, to gener oh, sorry. You, you have to generate the static pod manifest for the control plane, API server, control and manager scheduler, and then you have to do two actions that have to be synchronous. Uh, the first one is to add a, a static pod manifest for a new ATCD, and the second one is to act effectively, to actively join this new ATCD member to a, to a DC clans, uh, cluster. This is a critical operation, especially when you move from one, one member to two members because uh, ATCD has a short blackout when, uh, when it, it, it arranges a quorum. But we managed to get it well. And finally, uh, you, you don't have to deploy again the, uh, the in-cluster resources like a Kubernetes config map or whatever because the cluster already exists when, when you join the second, uh, the second control plane. And this is the, the history on uh, how we implemented this uh, in Kubernetes. It is an effort that started in, in uh, 1.11 and the first thing that, that, that uh, we, we did was to split all the, set, all the settings uh, which are cluster-wide, like, I don't know, the, the, the seeder for the, for the network, from the settings that are specific for, for one node. Hmm? Now you have the cluster configuration object and you have uh, the init configuration object or, or the join object. Then we implemented the first version of join control plane. But at, at the time, that was 112, we had only manual copy of certificates, and we were able to support only cluster with external TCD. The next release, we implemented support for scaling ATCD, but still with manual copy of certificates. And finally, last cycle, we implemented automatic copy of certificates. Hopefully, with the 115 release, we, we, will go in, we will go to beta with all, all this feature. So, back to Lubomir. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that uh, all the features that Fabrizio talked about is these, these are automatic. So, if you want to transition your cluster to HA, uh, QBDM can manage the HA cluster for you. Uh, so, that's, you know, that has been a a very important goal for us. Uh, so I wanted to talk about what, uh, quickly what is the roadmap for uh, you know 2019 and the next years. Uh, like Fabrizio said, get HA support uh, in QBADM to beta. 
uh, we currently only worked on uh, adding a single field in the config and getting the tests to run to basically have end-to-end -end signal for HA. But this, we are pretty, pretty close to getting this feature to beta. Uh, at the same time, get the V1 beta 2 configuration of Kubeadm to, uh, to be in place uh, this cycle. Uh, we, this is something that we work with the SIG Windows folks to get, uh, bring back Windows node supporting Kubeadm. We, as a, you know, we already have this working in a way. We just have to fix some parts, so hopefully uh, we can have some sort of a alpha release, possibly uh, in this release of Kubernetes. Uh, we have to cons consolidate the story with, uh, you know, certificate renewal, external CA support, and location of certificates. This has been a bit of a problem in Kubedium, but hopefully at least we can update the documentation this cycle. We have to, uh, like I said, we have to uh, improve our CI signal. We are working on this. And something that, uh, uh, this is the cleanup of uh, artifacts is something that we have been battling, uh, and also release a little bit uh, about that, but hopefully we can improve the picture of you know, depths and RPMs. Uh, they have been a bit of a problem for Cubadium in general. Uh, and also something that a lot of people have been requesting is uh, evaluate, like customize, and how we can customize uh, you know, live cluster configurations but we still need to uh, take time to work on that. Uh, if I can add something about this feature, Kubernetes Mini is historically a trade-off between uh, the uh, a request to support many more customization, many more scenario, and the need to keep something scoped, uh, easy to test, and, and, uh, and man manageable. And uh, this is a way that, that uh, we are looking for, for um, basically a low, the two scenario, the, the, the simple managed scenario, and the, the advanced scenario of user doing whatever they want. And this is something that we would like to, to have uh, feedback uh, for, from, the com uh, from the community before, and also help, if possible, before starting to execute in order to get it done right. Uh, uh, this slide is about uh, who is uh, maintaining Kubeadm, uh, basically how you can contribute. We have a list of uh, core active uh, contributors. Uh, that's uh, Tim, myself, uh, Ross, Jason, Liz, and Chuck from VMware. We have Marek and Rafael from SUSE. We have Alex and Ed from Intel. Uh, and not, not, uh, last but not least, Lucas, Fabrizio, and Iago, who are independent. We are e EU time zone friendly, which is not very common for uh, you know, Kubernetes 6. Uh, we also recently recorded an onboarding video, so if you're new, new and want to contribute, you definitely should check this link. Uh, we also basically want help with any, lab any tickets that are labeled like good first issue or help wanted or uh, sequester lifecycle. Uh, we also we are pretty active on the QBADM and sequester lifecycle channels, and you can also join our weekly meetings. We meet every week in the Kubadium office hours. And uh, also, you can, of course, contribute to our docs. Uh, so this is our logistics. Again, this overlaps with the previous slide. Basically, you can check these links to get involved. And uh, this is a quick uh, picture that outlines that, you know, uh, Kubadium is part of a much larger picture. Uh, it's, uh, it's a piece of a puzzle that SQL the lifecycle is trying to build. And it's, if you look at the diagram, Kubeadm uh, is the only GA item. So we need a lot of help with some, some of the other tools that we are currently working on, or uh, basically a plant, like for instance, etcd, ADM, cluster add-ons, these are like in the planning stages pre-alpha. We have cluster API that is alpha, it's super active currently. Uh, we have component configs, a lot of help is needed there. Kubeadm has one, you know, cluster API obviously has one, but. We need this across all the components. And on the top, we have some, basically any provisioner, for instance, like COPS or Spray that can utilize the whole set of tools that the SIG is developing. So that's pretty much it. Uh, question? Thank you. Uh, we, ha we have five minutes uh, for questions, sure. 
Hello. Uh, do you have any plans to support declarative update of clusters as well, cluster nodes? So currently, I see Qubitm init, join, reset. And if something has to be changed, I guess I can remove the node and add, re edit it again. But if something could be updated, uh, do you have any plans for that? I, I can answer. Hmm? I can answer to the one. So, in in moving HA to uh, general availability, we are also working to upgrade for HA. Currently, it is already supported, but basically the user experience is not ideal because we have two commands. One is, one is kubel mean upgrade config that upgrade the config for kubelet. And the other is kubel mean upgrade experimental control plane that upgrade the control plane on the secondary control plane nodes. Okay, so it is already supported, but you have to call two commands on the, on the secondary control plane nodes. What, what we want to do, I, I don't know if it will fit in this release or in the next one, is to provide only a single command that is kubelmin upgrade nodes that gives you a, a more simple experience. So also for upgrade, basically what you, you have to do, you have to run kubelmin upgrade apply on, one, on the first control plane node, like init, and then all, all the other node, you will run kubelmin up, upgrade node. This is the target that we have in mind. Does this answer to your question? Hmm? Well, actually, uh, it answers a, a question which is quite similar to mine. Hmm? Uh, my question was about updating configuration without changing the version. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, I, I, I mentioned one specific example that I had to cope with, hmm? which was changing the IP address of a master. Okay, okay. Ch changing the cluster is... Uh, uh, a long discussion. We, we are discussing a lot about this. Basically, we have two options. Hmm? One is to follow the path that uh, you use kubeadmin upgrade, passing a, a new config file with the same version, but something else changed. Okay, this is one option. The other option is to create... It, it has pro, uh, some pros, and, and also we know some cons of this approach. We consider it also, there is also some document uh, I can point to, to you there. We consider also some, another approach that is, that is to create a, a new command. Let's call it kubelmin change cluster that gives you change plan and change apply. So we start to figure it out, the, the tour flow. But the problem, uh, the problem, uh, the, the problem is, is huge because there are changes that um, basically are different. If you are changing a Kubelet configuration, you have to act on all the nodes. If you are changing a API server flag, you have to, you have to act to only to the control plane nodes. Mm -hmm. so, so we discussed this yesterday evening in, in a face-to-face. -face. The, the plan is to try to scope down the problem to some more simple and manageable use case and try to find out something rational. So we are working on these, and we will go step by step. Manage multiple nodes at the same time, Cluster API is your project. If you want to manage one node, customize it, the KubeADM eventually is going to support it, like one node at a time. Any questions? Yeah. So I understand how you build an HA cluster. Uh, there's also a scenario where I've got my HA cluster, everything's running fine, and one of my control nodes, uh, one of my control plane nodes blows up. Is it possible to replace that node? Does Kube Admin support that? Yes, it is possible. So uh, we, using the the join minus minus experimental control plane, you can create a, a new one. There is a currently there is a, a known problem. That if you are stored, uh, if you are using the, the stake of the TCD, hmm, and and you lose uh, the the control plane node, you have to clean up uh, the TCD membership. Otherwise, you can have problem. We are trying to get this fixed. Uh, also, this in this uh, 
in this release, but there is, this is, uh, we are going slowly because there is, back there is a, an issue in the ATCD client, and, and so we are trying to get this fixed in ATCD, so, so instead of uh, implementing a workaround. Hmm. Some other question? Yeah, so it's on another presentation. There's also the ability to bring your own certs, but when you're doing the upload certs, have you considered pushing those into like another sort of secret vault rather than storing them in the cluster itself? In another secret? In another, in another vault, like if you've got you know, HashiCorp vault or Key Vault or something like that, where you've got machine identity already there, could you use that to delegate access to those secrets rather than storing them in the cluster itself? Yes, we have considered m m many options. This one that we implemented is basically self-contained. You, you don't have to depend on something else. Hmm? Uh, but uh, we still support other workflow. Uh, because uh, you, you can create your certificates in advance on, on, a, on a node and then copy on the first node and that could mean repeat or, or make them available on each node. Those, those are also scenario supported. So uh, there are users that generate certs and, and, and do this way. What, what is tricky is that if you want to use the dynamic workflow, you don't know in advance all the certificate signs. Yeah. Mm. So my suggestion in this scenario is just generate um, certificate authorities and let Kubernetes generate the, the certificates which are specific for the nodes, which are the client certificates. Okay? Any more questions? Probably was one. Thanks. Uh, so uh, my question is a little bit hypothetical, maybe. So uh, Cube ADM uh, kind of abstracts away or, or codifies uh, the workflow for setting up Kubernetes cluster. Uh, like, uh, has there ever been uh, discussions on uh, maybe abstracting away that logic into an operator so that, uh, like, uh, I'm not. Kubernetes cluster can, from from a, like a um, from a resource uh, definition, uh, can create another uh, Kubernetes cluster. Yes, uh, and uh, th this discussion basically sums up to the work that we are having to the cluster API. I, there will uh, tomorrow there will be a talk about cluster API, uh, and we talk about also a lot of uh, in the past day. Cluster API gives you an abstraction. Mm? that allows you to create machine and to spin up con uh, a Kubernetes cluster on those machines. Just to give you a, 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 a very high level overview, you have machine, machine sets, and, and machine deployments. And uh, this is a declarative. Uh, there is uh, some tricks in order to get this machine restarted because you are using Kubernetes to create it uh, uh, itself. So there is a chicken and egg problem that should be solved, that this is solved. The work is, there is a, lo a lot of work in the cluster API um, stream of six cluster lifecycle. And then cluster API uh, use operators. Those operators use, uh, can use Kubernetes or can use whatever else to, to create the Kubernetes cluster. So it, it is also extensible. So a lot, lot of work to, to, to getting there, but we are already working at this uh, higher level of abstraction on, on tool Kubernetes. You remember the Unix philosophy, Kubernetes does one thing and another thing take care of, of the higher level. So that's the, all the questions we have? Uh, I think uh, that we are, uh, one more. One more. Okay. Uh, first of all, thanks for the discussion. It was a nice presentation. Uh, I have a question because you mentioned that uh, right now it's uh, hard to define in advance the IPs and all the information about the, the control plane. So how are you clustering the ETCD? Sorry, could you repeat? How you, how you cluster the ETCD node, uh, and as you mentioned, this is hard in advance to know all the information. So how the, uh, and you said that 
the connection from the control plane is to localhost. So how the etcd underneath is clustered? Ah, how etcd is, it is connected with the API server? Uh, no, no. Uh, how the etcd each to each other ah, is connected? How okay. the cluster is? No, no. Uh, this is a good, uh, actually a good question. So API server is talking to the to the local etcd, but each etcd are talking to to the other. And, and this is possible because basically, even if you don't know the ATCD member that will come afterwards, ATCD syncs that, that point between the member. So when you create the cluster, you have to provide only one existing endpoint, then it join and it sync and it find out all the new one. So we, we, are, we are leveraging on an internal machinery of ATCD to get all the ATCD members synced. Great. Thank you, uh, everyone. Enjoy the party. <laughs>